Welcome to Wichita Liberty TV with Bob Weeks. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Wichita and Kansas government and public policy. We're broadcast on KGPT channel 26.1, also its companion website, kgpt26.com. Well, a quick programming note, starting today, Wichita Liberty TV will be shown on Sundays at 4.30 p.m. rather than 5.30. The 8.30 a.m. morning time remains the same. On today's show, Congressman Mike Pompeo appears. Mike Pompeo is in his second term representing the 4th District of Kansas, which is the Wichita metropolitan area and surrounding counties going west to include Edwards, Kiowa, and Comanche counties, and east to include Greenwood, Elk, and Chautauqua counties. Pompeo went to college at the United States Military Academy at West Point. He graduated first in his class and then in 1986 served as a cavalry officer patrolling the Iron Curtain before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mike serves on two major committees, Energy and Commerce, which oversees energy, health care, manufacturing, and telecommunications. Also, the House Intelligence Committee, which oversees America's intelligence gathering efforts. His congressional website says that while in Congress, Mike has focused on freeing private enterprise to succeed as well as defending our individual constitutional rights. Mike has been at the center of debate regarding fiscal responsibility and halting regulatory overreach, particularly with respect to production agriculture and reducing the imposition of burdens on entrepreneurs and small businesses. As always, please visit wichitaliberty.org. You can subscribe to the email newsletter I send two or three times a week. And if you'd like to contact me, you can find my email address there or just remember bob.weeks at gmail.com. Now, my interview with United States Representative Mike Pompeo. Well, Representative Mike Pompeo, welcome to Wichita Liberty TV. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on, Bob. Now, before being elected to Congress, you were a business executive, but also the Republican National Committee man from Kansas. And I think a lot of people don't know what that job is. So could you, could you explain to us what that job was? Oh, sure. So it's a volunteer gig, okay. uh, elected by the precinct committee people. Mm -hmm. And uh, through a very democratic grassroots process, they select a national committee man and a national committee woman mm -hmm. uh, from Kansas, as well as a state party chairman. And those three people represent Kansas at the Republican National Committee. You'll hear the term RNC or mm -hmm. Republican National Committee. Today the leader is Reince Priebus. Right. Uh, and then in turn, the three people from each of the states select the chairman. In this case, okay. the, after my time, they elected Reince Priebus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you represent Kansas and the Kansas Republican Party at the national level as part of the party apparatus. And okay. I did that for uh, about a year and a half before I ran for office. Okay. All right. Well, very good. Now, in your biography, um, it says you served as a cavalry officer in the United States Army. And first of all, I want to ask you, that sounds like horses. You know, that's what people think about cavalry. But more important with that, a, a profile earlier this year of you said, as a cavalry officer on the Iron Curtain in the late 1980s, Representative Mike Pompeo would look over to the East German side and see guard towers and dogs blocking people from freely moving west. So, your military education at West Point and then your service in the waning days of the cold, waning years of the Cold mm -hmm. War, how did that prepare you for your service in the United States Congress today? How does that influence the way you think about world affairs? Well, that's an excellent question. So it was, in fact, Bob, you have it right, the very tail end of the Cold War, this mm -hmm. battle against communism uh, that America fought for decades. Uh, and I did see it. I saw it up close and personal. We patrolled uh, 100 plus kilometers of what was the Czechoslovakian and then East German border. Mm -hmm. uh, we ran patrols 24-7 uh, every day. Uh, and you could watch where freedom was on one side and it wasn't on the other. That that idea of, of when a wall comes down, people migrating towards freedom mm -hmm. very much impacts the way I think about not only our national security issues, but our economic issues too. Uh, people want choices. They want opportunity. They want uh, the chance to go succeed, mm -hmm. and they want to live in a society that permits that, a free society that allows that. And so when we think about how we behave abroad and here domestically, uh, we should always be moving toward freedom and away from uh, big government and enormous regulation and the heavy hand of what uh, inevitably happens when government gets too much power. And the cavalry today, that's like tanks instead of horses. So, Is no, that it? so no horses, Bob. Okay. Uh, they moved away from that some time ago. Now they bring them out for parades only. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the cavalry today is really the same kind of mission. 
uh, performs the scout mission out in front, uh, designed to be the early warning uh, units that I identify see. when enemy forces are coming. So that cavalry mission that was performed in the Civil Civil War by Jeb Stuart uh, mm-hmm. and all the great cavalrymen of, of uh, yesteryear is now performed with Bradley vehicles and M1 tanks. Okay, I see. Now, speaking about the Cold War, you were just in Poland and Ukraine earlier this month. And, of course, that uh, affairs in that part of the, uh, the world and Russia are in the news at the top of every newscast these days. What did you learn when you were there? What's going on there? Uh, and do we need to be worried about Russia and Vladimir Putin today? So I, there were really three takeaways that I, I think are important. First, uh, Vladimir Putin truly does believe what he says. When he says that he believes the uh, uh, single worst event in the history of the last century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union, he believes that. He would like to recreate I think I, greater Russia. I think I saw you say earlier today, yeah, recreate the, the Soviet Union right. of, of the old days. Yeah, he, wa- he wants to build it back, and so that's his mission. Uh, he'll do that in as many different ways as it takes to to get to that point. Uh, I was in Warsaw and I was in Kiev. Uh, they're they're very worried. It it probably won't look like the Cold War that I fought. It probably won't look like Russian tanks rolling. They took Crimea. That is, Russia took Crimea without moving a single armored vehicle mm-hmm. across any boundary. They did it with special forces, political propaganda, essentially government takedown from the inside. And that's mm-hmm. what they're working on in eastern Ukraine as well. Uh, for America, this matters for a handful of reasons, not the least of which is we've made commitments. Uh, the Ukrainians, you'll recall, Bob, gave up their nuclear weapons. Uh, they were one of the four or five largest holders of nuclear weapons in the world. And they gave up their nuclear weapons. So a lot of their missile silos were there, kind of like they used to be around pre- pre- Wichita. Pre- precisely right. Uh, and they got rid of them because we provided security assurances. We said, we don't want you to have nuclear weapons. We think the world will be safer. They said, fine. In exchange for that, we agreed. We signed something called the Budapest Memorandum in 1994. Mm-hmm. And we said if there was ever a threat to Ukraine, we'd provide a security assurance. And today we've seen that that has not proven to be worth the paper it was written on. And so as Putin continues to expand, whether the next effort is in eastern Ukraine or Moldova or Belarus, wherever it may be, I don't believe that our president will do the things it takes to let Vladimir Putin know that we're serious about this. Mm -hmm. Uh, No no one's talking about a brigade or a division. or We're talking about uh, military assistance, training, intelligence sharing, the kinds of things you can do to let the enemy know that you're serious about protecting uh, folks who want freedom and want liberty and not folks who want uh, to continue to violate basic principles of property law and sovereignty. Mm-hmm. Now, to the north of Ukraine, there are uh, four nations, Poland, where you were, and then the Baltic states, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, I think they are, that are members of NATO. And now you hear these days NATO Article 5 in the news, and no one ever really explains that. So what is Article 5 of NATO? How does that apply? My that come into play someday soon? It could certainly come into play. Article 5 of the NATO Charter uh, is essentially the mutual security agreement that the nations who are member uh, member states of NATO Mm -hmm. have all signed. It essentially says, and Ukraine is not a member. They tried to, they wanted to become part of NATO and it it did not happen for a series of reasons. Uh, So Article 5 says it's essentially come one, come all, right? If any member state is attacked, the other nations have an obligation to support them. But I got to tell you, Bob, I'm I'm very concerned. Uh, NATO doesn't have an enormous standing force. There's no NATO army. It requires uh, nations to say, you bet, I'll send 2,000, I'll send 5,000, or I'll send munitions or provide other kinds of resources. The Eastern Europeans and Western Europeans have enormous business interests in Russia, and they are very reluctant to do something as simple as sanctions against Mm -hmm. uh, Russia as a result of that. They think it'll hurt their own economy. And when you're when you're not ready to take those simple actions, someone like Vladimir Putin sees green light, mm-hmm. uh, right? Sees the capacity uh, to continue to to expand his empire with nearly no cost. Mm-hmm. Is he an evil person like Stalin and Hitler were, or a more modern version of them? Or do we really need to be concerned about him? Do you think? Boy, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to the the question about the nature of the human being, uh, but I I can answer that. Uh, he, he, he has a vision for what greater Russia would look like. Uh, he was an, an agent in the KGB at a time that they were part of the old regime, what right. the old Soviet Union looked like, a totalitarian He's state. He's about 60 years old. I think, is he, that's, I think. I think mm-hmm. that's right, right? The totalitarian times when there were the gulags and all, 
all the 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 the, the programs, all all the terrible things that were taking place inside that country. That is a man who was raised mm-hmm. at that time, and I think mm-hmm. it's part of who he is. It's his part of his legacy and history. And so I do think uh, I think the West has an obligation to do the things we can that uh, that will continue to promote a democratic vision around the world. So I do. I think we have a lot to worry about with Vladimir Putin. He's got a weak economy. He's got a lot of things holding him back as well. We should exploit those weaknesses to keep him in his box. And I think uh, Ronald Reagan kind of revealed that the Soviet Union always had a weak economy. They just spent a heck of a lot <laughs> of their resources on nuclear arms and submarines and ships and things like that. Do we need to be worried about a revival of the Cold War where we're going to have to build fallout shelters again or something like that, do you think? You no, know, I think it'll end up looking a little bit different. A lot of the uh, today... Uh, much of the conflict uh, is physical in some sense, but it's economic as well, right? It's this I idea, see. it's this idea that uh, uh, economies drive the capacity for security. We need a strong economy at home so that we can continue to provide security for Americans. Mm-hmm. Uh, really, uh, when I, when I think about American security or national security, I think about what does this mean to America. When I think about Ukraine, I think about I care about the Ukrainian people deeply. <laughs> Uh, but I mostly have as my task as a member of the House of Representatives to keep Americans safe, mm-hmm. uh, and we do need we do need to worry. This is this is a this is a man who today uh, is between us and Iran in our negotiations in Iran. Mm-hmm. He is the keeper of the keys with respect to the chemical weapons in Syria. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. The commitment was to have all the weapons out of Syria. Remember, we were we were about to take some action. The Russians stepped in and said, "We'll get rid of the chemical weapons." I think the num- last number I saw was 4% of the weapon, chemical weapons have been moved out of oh. Syria. The commitment was to have 100% of them out some months ago. Uh, the Russians are flying airplanes along the Arctic Circle in places they've not flown before. Mm. This is what happens when a president makes commitments and re- draws red lines and then uh, allows them to be violated with no repercussions. So, uh, the, one of the most important things, you know this, Bob, is if you say you're going to do something, you darn well better be ready to do it. And to date, this president has not been able to muster that. And you brought up Iran and Syria, uh, two countries we kind of consider maybe to add to the axis of evil, or I guess Iran maybe was one, but but Putin does business with them. He cultivates a relationship with them, doesn't he? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Russian Russian weapon systems, Russian business interests. Uh, we have a temporary agreement with Iran. Uh, the Russians are there exchanging in uh, enormous commerce uh, inside of Iran. And uh, th- th- that's the kind of folks, right? And Iran is the sponsor for Hezbollah, who's mm-hmm. doing enormous harm inside of Syria and will ultimately wreak havoc on America as well. Uh, the, the, these are folks that uh, we all wish we could step back and just focus on America. But sadly, the threat remains. And so long as the threat remains, we have an obligation to engage and defeat them. Okay. Well, let's take a moment off for a commercial break. And when we, we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. We have Mike Pompeo with us this week. Um, On economic issues, there's something called the Export-Import Bank. I think maybe people have heard of that but don't really know what it does. That's something that you voted against the authorization, reauthorization of in 2012. It's coming up again. Could you explain to our viewers what does the Export-Import Bank do? Do we need it? And how do you plan to vote this year? Uh, So the Export-Import Bank has been around an awfully long time. It began as a very small uh, agency. It was aimed at trying to, uh, I, th- I think its initial mission was to balance what's going on in other countries. We were trying to sell equipment into other nations, and those nations were competing unfairly. And so we were trying to balance that out. We were trying to, uh, what it does is it provides a U.S. Treasury, translate that taxpayer backstop. Me? Uh, you, okay. me, all of us, uh, backstop for loans, commercial loans that are made for us to sell product uh, all over the world, mm-hmm. uh, a, a good thing for sure. Uh, I voted against it because, uh, from my perspective, uh, it's a subsidy to the folks who are selling. These are often um, big businesses mm-hmm. who can be very successful and can take risk on their own. They don't need the taxpayer to back up what they're doing. I understand the argument. Our European competitors are doing it. Our Asian competitors are doing it. I, I understand that argument as well. But it seems to me the tit for tat, uh, you you up your subsidy, we'll up ours, mm-hmm. uh, is not, not the right direction to go. Okay. Uh, it does come up for reauthorization again sometime late summer, early fall, if I recall correctly. Uh, there have been a number of reforms proposed by uh, Jeb Hensling and some other conservatives that mm-hmm. I hope we can accomplish. 
if we accomplish those and put this on terms that are more commercial, it's something I could potentially support. But if it looks like just a naked reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank of old, I'll vote no again. I uh, saw there was a debate, I think, uh, oh, this is with the Environmental Development Agency, the EDA, which is another economic issue. That's kind of something that I think, you know, I'm interested in. That's an agency, part of the Department of Commerce, I believe, that gives grants to local companies, some in Wichita. You sponsored legislation to abolish that agency, but um, I think uh, you've, you got a fair number of votes for it, but it didn't pass, did it? It didn't. Uh, disappointing in many respects. The Economic Devel De Development Agency is an agency I'd never heard of when I came to Congress. Uh, it's a couple of $300 million a year worth of spending. Uh, small money by Washington standards, big, is, money yeah. for, big, big money for me and you. But it's uh, um, I've gone after it because it's the prototypical crony capitalist uh, endeavor. Uh, it is a couple million dollars in every one congressional district. Mm -hmm. That's how it politically has stayed alive. Uh, it'll do projects. It does projects in South Central Kansas. The projects themselves are fine, but the federal government has no role in allocating the capital in the way that it does through the Economic Development Agency. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it was in my very first year in Congress, I offered a piece of legislation to get rid of it. I got 70 votes, I think. The disappointment there was uh, that means 70 votes. That means only 70 Republicans voted for it, too. No Democrats. No right. Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, but the majority of our own caucus, the conservative caucus, right? didn't support it either. I offered it again a second time. I got a hundred and something. So I think I increased by 50%. And so we're going to actually have a chance, I think, in the coming months to offer that again. We'll keep grinding. If we can continue to get 50% improvement, I eventually get to the 218 I need in the House of Representatives. It would be, it would be a good statement. Uh, apart from the couple of hundred million dollars it saves, it would be a good statement about the government getting out of the old earmark business. This is this is several hundred million dollars of earmarks wrapped into an agency, and uh, we we ought to get out of that. We've gotten rid of earmarks. We should get rid of this too. They're they're bad for America. They're frankly bad for even in some cases the recipients. Um, if they went to a commercial market, their project would have to be better in its own right. You know, it's kind of funny. There was the debate on the floor of the House of Representatives, you and Marcy Kaptur, a Democrat of Ohio, and she seemed to scold you a little bit talking about all the agricultural subsidies Kansas gets, and you're just in your first term, she said, I think, and maybe you don't understand the way things work here. I remember the conversation very well. I, uh, I wasn't quick enough on my feet to remind her that uh, I was proud that I'd only been there a little while, and I think one of the problems might be that she'd been there too long. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, apart from that uh, little personal um, debate, uh, Marcy Kaptur, and frankly, even some folks on our side, well, they want to bring earmarks back. They want to go back to the old place. They continue to want to take more money from taxpayers and take it to Washington. It's not the way we need to go. There are no doubt uh, there are uh, handouts that have come to the agriculture community here in Kansas. Uh, we ought to work to phase them out quickly as well. I've argued to get rid of the uh, ethanol tax credit, and mm -hmm. we managed to get rid of it. Right, uh, but there's still the mandate. Yeah. And, and there's still, still the mandate sitting there. The renewable fuel standard ought to be eliminated as well. Uh, those are the kind of things elected officials have to do. They matter to Kansas. Mm -hmm. I understand that too. But I promise you, when we bring resources back to Kansas, Kansans will figure out how to succeed. I have have great confidence in us. Well, let's hold that thought about energy there as we take our second commercial break with Mike Pompeo on Wichita Liberty TV. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks with Representative Mike Pompeo. Uh, talking about energy a little bit earlier, um, one of the big uh, things that uh, is, I think, a real national issue is the PTC, or Production Tax Credit, for the production of energy from renewable sources, which is uh, wind predominantly and solar, I guess a little bit um, less than that. This is something that we spend a lot of money on, yet I think that wind and solar account for only like 2% mm -hmm. of our electricity output uh, throughout the country. A um, lot of wind farms in Kansas and more being built all the time. What's wrong with this production tax credit? Um, why are you opposed to it? So a lot of wind farms in Kansas, a lot of uh, wind component manufacturing in Kansas. I think that's great. Uh, but uh, Bob, you, you can't live off the federal taxpayer forever. We shouldn't allocate uh, decisions on our energy sources based on uh, political power. We should allocate our energy resources based on what consumers want. Mm -hmm. right? We should have the most affordable energy source we can choose. And today that's not wind, it's not solar, save for in a few little places where it works and when it does it, it ought to. 
Uh, but for an awfully long time, a lot of these energy sources have been saying, if you just give me money for a little while, uh, we'll get competitive. We'll be able to compete with traditional energy sources like coal and natural gas or oil. Uh, and the wind now, industry has been saying that for 20 years and, or so, just a little now, bit longer, and right? Yeah, a little bit longer. And now, literally decades later, they're still not there. And my judgment is they need to stand on their own two feet. Uh, we could support 40 different energy industries. I've had dozens of energy companies come in and say, I have the solution, Mike. If the federal government will just give me some money, I can get there. My answer is always, just go get there. You've got smart engineers, smart technologists. Go get there. And when you do, go compete. And I promise you, consumers will buy your product if you provide good value, uh, price, uh, deliver, delivery, reliability, all of the things that consumers want in energy. When you get there, they'll buy it. Well, I think a lot of people are confused also that the production tax credit, they're really economically equivalent to a cash payment. Um, a lot of people, they criticize special breaks that other industries like the oil industry has, which I think are roughly equal in dollar amount, but considering how small an impact mm -hmm. electricity has. But what oil has, those are really just deductions, which are different than credits by far, but I don't think a lot of people understand the difference. Yeah, it's a little confusing. Uh, it's kind of arcane tax code stuff. Uh, I'll concede that, but it is different. Every business ought to be able to deduct its expenses, mm -hmm. right? And if you, when I was in the manufacturing business, when we paid employees or bought raw material metal, we deducted that from our revenue and we pay taxes on our profits the years that we made money. Uh, every company ought to be permitted to do, to do that. And indeed, the wind energy ought to be able to deduct its ordinary business expenses. Right. And so uh, I brook no, no uh, ill towards that. Uh, but tax credits are a totally different thing. It's essentially a cash transfer. Mm -hmm. Now, the oil and gas industry has tax credits, too. And I have advocated for their elimination. They mm -hmm. should be gone, too. There's a marginal oil well tax credit. There are about two and a half dozen in the tax code. Uh, that impacts solar and algae and wind, we ought to get rid of every single one of them. This is not about being anti-wind or favoring one energy source. This is about getting the taxpayer off the hook and picking as and between and amongst energy sources. I think a lot of people say tax credit, oh, that's just a tax law thing. It doesn't really impact much, but it's real money, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's real money. Mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. of lost taxpayer revenue. And when the government's got to collect money to pay for goods and services that it delivers to the American people, someone else is picking up that tax. Some taxpayer is picking up that cost. Or we borrow more or, or, uh, or we, use inflation to pay for we, some of that. Or we allow the Chinese to loan us money temporarily. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, kind of on a more personal note, um, Representative Pompeo, when you're in Washington, what's a typical day of a, of a congressman like, if I could ask? You bet. So in Washington, my days look very different than the days I'm in Kansas. Uh, I usually fly out on the 6.05 a.m. Monday morning American flight to Chicago, okay. mm -hmm. uh, and I'm in Washington typically Monday through Thursday of each week and fly back to Kansas uh, after that. In Washington, a typical day would look like uh, three major segments. One, folks who come to Washington to see me. Okay. A lot of Kansans come to visit. They'll come to my office, or I'll meet them uh, out some in some place uh, talking about uh, the myriad of issues, all the things that impact Kansas. Right. Another maybe third of my time is spent in committees. I sit on two committees, the Energy and Commerce Committee mm -hmm. that oversees telecommunications, energy, and health care. And then I sit on a second committee that is the House Intelligence Committee that oversees America's intelligence operations. So I spend about a third of my time doing committee work, either in committee or preparing mm -hmm. and helping the committee perform its oversight functions. And then the third piece would be the legislative piece, the, the traditional constitutional responsibility in Article One, mm -hmm. voting, okay. time on the House floor and preparing for votes on the mm -hmm. House floor. Yeah. And, you know, I um, when you spoke at the Wichita Pachyderm Club, I think that was back on February 7th, I happened to be seated next to Mrs. Pompeo, Susan Pompeo, your wife, and, and I asked her, do you and Mike watch the Netflix series House of Cards? And she says, oh, yes, we do. We do. And uh, so my question for you was going to be, you know, I don't want to be a spoiler for anybody <laughs> out there to tell because now there's season two that's out. But uh, Frank Underwood is quite a, a ruthless uh, operator, seems to be someone who's more concerned about just gaining power uh, rather than actually legislating useful type of things. How realistic is the House of Cards in representing what actually happens in Washington? So uh, we're only through season one, so okay. I so don't spoil anything for me in okay. season two. We'll eventually queue it up and, oh. and queue it up and watch them all as well. 
Uh, you know, he's a caricature mm-hmm. of of uh, of power accumulation, and so he's over the top and uh, designed to attract viewers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you do see that, Bob. And uh, after all, in season one, he killed a, a yes, man. Yes, no, um, not, not, to the best of my knowledge, nobody's killed anybody since I, I've been there. Uh, you know, uh, he's a caricature, and so, but there are folks that are back there who, uh, who whose desire is just to continue to be there, right? They want to accumulate power. Uh, for the sake of accumulating power, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to, to accumulating influence in order to achieve an agenda, something that you want to get done for your constituents or for America. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's a television show. Uh, but you do see at times, especially as I've seen them trying to get go out and rally votes when they're trying to accumulate enough votes to the pass whipping. legislation, the whipping process. Um, that process exists. Uh, folks come to you. I spend time trying to get folks to vote, folks to vote for things I care about. The horse trading you see is not very real. I think it may have existed some years ago, right? I think it, times were different. You could offer a district money for a flood control project or money for a bridge. It happened up until earmarks were limited just uh, just now a, a few years ago. So that was I think, right as you came right in. Right as right. I came in. Uh, and is that it's, prohibition or reduction of earmarks, is that holding fast? Or I think you mentioned that some people would like for it to return. There are people who would like for it to return. It has held fast in my entire time. And you see the outcome, Bob. It uh, it doesn't just impact the earmark, right? Remember, those earmarks go, for example, for a transportation bill. Right. And so it's not just the 200000 for the earmark or the half a million for the earmark. It's a $500 million or $50 billion spending program that happens as a result of that earmarking process. It, uh, it's a corrupting influence, mm-hmm. and I'm very glad that they've gone away. Okay, well, very good. Well, I think that we're, uh, we've are we run out of time. It just seems to buy, uh, go by very fast. So thank you very much, thank Mike you. Pompeo, thank for you, stopping by, and uh, good luck back in Washington. Thank you, sir.